Pray with me. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Amen. You know, there are a lot of famous people in the world. You know, Putin and Trudeau, those faces, they stand out in recent weeks, yeah? But who's the most famous person in the world today? There are a lot of famous people in history. But who stands head and shoulders above all of them? Y'all know the answer. Every Sunday school child knows the answer to every question the preacher asks is? Jesus. Yeah. All right? Now, how in the world did a Jewish carpenter from a little tiny town in Nazareth called Nazareth near the Sea of Galilee get so famous? And this is before social media. Well, the season of Epiphany, which concludes today, has told that story. All the readings show how Jesus was manifested from his obscure birth to the fame, the worldwide fame that he enjoys. It started with a, a visit from three kings, the Magi from the east. His manifestation then continued with his baptism there in the Jordan River. Then he went up to Cana, and he did that miracle turning water into wine at, at a wedding. And Jesus' glory is being revealed more and more to a wider and wider circle of people. And after seven weeks, it reaches its peak uh, on a mountaintop, a mountaintop experience. I could get cornier, but I won't. Uh, in the transfiguration story that I just read for you. It's the last Sunday of Epiphany. It's the best Epiphany saved for last Epiphany. Here, Jesus literally shines forth. I mean, he's bright as the sun. Now, as they did usually in the evening, Jesus went to pray and he took with him his three closest disciples. Among the twelve, there's Peter, James, and John. They accompany him up the hill for their nighttime prayers. They go to higher ground, and as usual, Peter, James, and John, because it's at night, they've had a long day on the road, well, they, uh, they're dozing off, heavy with sleep, until, uh, well, a bright light pierces their eyelids rousing them from their slumber. Now, the brightest light these guys have ever seen at night is a full moon, all right, or a torch, you know, a pitch wrapped around a stick and you light that thing. That's the brightest light these guys have ever seen at night, but now the stadium lights are on. <laughs> oh my gosh! They've never seen anything like it. And they're shielding their eyes, they're cowering in terror, and through the, you know, they're looking through the slits between their fingers, and they see Jesus in the light. And as they keep looking, they realize, no, Jesus isn't in the light, the light is in Jesus. Now, people in our day are fond of using superlative language to describe ordinary things. This is just hilarious to me. You know, somebody will take a sip of wine over at Duquesne Winery and they'll say, this wine is awesome. Awesome. Wow, okay. That's some good wine. 
Uh, or they'll say, you know, they'll have a dinner over at uh, Magnolia's and they'll be like, this dinner is unbelievable. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, it's great, but it's not unbelievable. But now here on this mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, we see something that is truly unbelievable. It is absolutely awesome, literally awesome. And they're hiding their faces in terror. Now, in spite of this sensory overload, Peter somehow finds words to speak. Leave it to Peter. He, he's the guy for that. Um, and he's so impressed at what he sees his guy Jesus as. Well, it's not just him because Moses and Elijah are there too in all this glory. And he's so impressed that Jesus is with the big guys, Moses, Elijah, that he wants to build a tent, a tabernacle for each of them so that they don't go away. Like, let's preserve this moment. And then God speaks from this luminous cloud engulfing the top of the mountain. And he says, no, Peter, <laughs> no tents, because this is my beloved son. You need to listen to him. This is one of my favorite mysterious moments in the Bible. What's going on here? And what's the deal with the tents? Why is Peter getting in trouble for offering to build tents? The key to unlock the mystery of this event is Moses and Elijah standing there with Jesus. Why? Why are they there? Well, both Moses and Elijah share something very much in common. They met God on the holy mountain. They've been face to face, they're as close as you can get to face to face with Yahweh on the holy mountain. You remember Moses on Mount Sinai, right? I mean, we saw him last summer in our series on the book of Exodus. God's glory, called Shekinah, rested atop, it engulfed the top of Mount Sinai, with a rushing wind, with an earthquake, with flames of fire. God spoke to Israel from the mountaintop. It was terrifying. But Moses alone was called out from the people to enter the cloud to talk with God. And when Moses came down the mountain, we just read it, his face glowed. He was transformed by the experience. Now, several centuries later, as recorded in 1 Kings 19, we see Elijah in the same place. And we're going to get to know Elijah this coming summer in our Old Testament series where we'll look at the divided monarchy period of Israel in the north and Judea in the south, all right? Elijah was the big prophet at that time. And after confronting the prophets of Baal, Elijah fled into the wilderness, looking for God, despondent, very discouraged. He thought maybe he could find God at Sinai. So he went back to that place, and sure enough, God came, met him there. And with a rushing wind, with an earthquake, with flames of fire, God appeared. And at the heart of that experience, there's Elijah hearing God speak in a still, small voice. Now, returning to the gospel story, we see that both now are present together on what Peter called the holy mountain, with Jesus of Nazareth. There's the glory cloud of God in, engulfing the mountaintop. There's the voice of God speaking to his people. But this time, look how Yahweh is present in the person of Jesus. Glowing with a radiance of a holiness that belongs to God alone. 
So I guess this uh, sheds some light. I told you I could get cornier. Uh, uh, it sheds some light on Peter's offer to build three tents. See, Peter is thinking, wow, look at Jesus. Look who he's hanging with, the big guys, Moses, Elijah. Peter mistook Jesus as just a great man of God, on par with Moses and Elijah. One guy in a lineup of religious leaders. But the voice of God is saying, He's infinitely more. He's not one of many paths to God. He is God made man far above Moses and Elijah, Muhammad or Marx or anyone else you want to compare him to. Listen to him. Because he's the reason people no longer worship Zeus. He is the reason people no longer worship Aphrodite or Baal or Odin or Ishtar or Huitzilopochtli. Huitzilopochtli? Who is this? You know who he is? Was? <laughs> was. Uh, Huitzilopochtli was the Aztec sun god. You've seen him portrayed in those Mexican sundials with a great fanged, gaping mouth with a tongue sticking out. All right, so they worshiped him by offering tens of thousands of people as living sacrifices. They would cut open their abdomen. They'd pull the heart out, still beating, and offer it to Huitzilopochtli. People don't do that anymore. Because of Jesus. So can you see how Jesus' glory outshines them all? Is that awesome or what? But so what? So what? It's nice to see that, but what difference does it make for us now? I'm glad you asked that question. Because <laughs> the prayer that I uh, opened with points the way. Almighty God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. All right? You with me on this? You see that? The transfiguration shows Jesus to be literally, <laughs> all right, the light of the world. And from that experience on that holy mountain, He's transforming his people, you and me, little by little, and sending us out to reflect his light in the world. Through prolonged exposure to our Lord, and the prayer identifies word and sacraments, okay? Through prolonged exposure to our Lord, reverently receiving his word and his sacraments, his character seeps into our character. His character shines through our character, through you, for others to see. In the love and care that we show to one another, in the loving witness that we give to those who don't yet know God. There's a lot of them out there, folks. So we go, and we serve, and we witness this little light of mine, letting it shine, that he may be known, 
worshipped and obeyed to the ends of the earth. It's like he's the sun, and we're the moon over here, reflecting his light to those in darkness for others to see. His love, his glory, to be that to each other, folks, to take it with you into the world. In our Lenten Supper series, we're going to dis- discuss how we can do our part here at St. Pete so that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. So this is how Jesus became so famous. His generation after generation through many centuries of God's people coming down from the mountain like Moses, glowing. Although, you know, Moses had a unique experience there, but we, we do the same. And just think of all the ways we do it here at St. Peter's. Our work with Tree of Life, offering loving provision and witness to thousands of our neighbors every week, month, year. Dell, Tracy doing great work leading that. So many others volunteering at Tree of Life. Our work with Mosaic, the Crisis Pregnancy Center, providing care and support to women with unplanned pregnancies. Anne and Maggie and Amanda putting in so many hours over so many years and so many others helping. There's our work in Guatemala. Bob Loker leading that, those trips year after year. And this year, Bob is very excited to be traveling to Liberia as well to visit our friends there. We have a lot of friends in Liberia. In fact, our work at St. Peter's in Liberia, it reaches back to the mid-1800s. Check this out. Some of you know this story. The name the Heatons. Here in the Loudoun Valley, they were a founding family of St. Peter's, our church back in the 1870s. Decades before that, the Heatons were doing great work as Christians in the Loudoun Valley. Miss Heaton was the last of the Heatons here. She was our organist here into the 1960s. But back in 1834, the Heaton family decided to give freedom to their slaves. Slaveholding, Episcopalians, decided to free their slaves. 30 years before emancipation became the policy of the United States. They helped them gain an education. They helped them find their way back to Africa if they wanted to travel there. They ended up settling in Caldwell, Liberia. And we visited Caldwell, Liberia back in 2015. Paul Miller and I went. We went to St. Peter's Caldwell, a sister parish founded by the descendants of those Heaton slaves. And Bob's going to visit our friends there again this spring. It's very exciting. So from the 19th century to the 20th century, and now here in the 21st century, every Christian in every generation is called to reflect the glory of Jesus to let their light shine in the world by living the love that Jesus modeled for us, by serving others in ways that change the lives of others, by bearing witness to the reality of Jesus as the most famous man in history, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. So I wonder what that's going to look like for you, each of you, in 2022. Let's pray about it.